this is how they want it set up so we'll have to live it. Because the capital factory graciously gives us this. <laughs> All right, is she doing it? Yep. Okay. So, press play. How does it, how is it? Am I close enough? Yeah, you're perfect. Okay. Absolutely. So, if you want to welcome everyone to the Marketing and Automation and AI Meetup. We're so glad you can make it today. Just some housekeeping rules, and then I'll introduce our featured speaker, Fernando. The meetup goes from 6.30 to 8.30. From 7 to 7.45, we have question and answers. I mean, oh, sorry, I screwed it up. Okay, from 7 to 7.45 is the presentation, and then there's 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. Sorry, that's why I need to read this. <laughs> we have a hard stop at 8.30, and then Capital Factory closes the doors. I just wanted to say thanks to our sponsor, Capital Factory, if anyone here is interested in becoming a member or they're co-working, Emily, our liaison, is out there. She'll uh, give you info. She'll also validate your parking, so don't leave. She's right in front, right in front there. She's the one with the black hair. She's real cute, sweet. Um, don't forget to get it. So now let's get to our speaker. Eight months ago, I attended the inaugural meeting of Marketing, Automation, and AI Meetup Group. When I moved to Austin seven years ago, I jumped on the networking bandwagon, which is when I first met Fernando Lavastida. He, we were all networking, you know, like, trying to meet a bunch of people, business stuff. And But in January of 2023, my obsession with AI started, and I went to so many AI related meetups and events. So when this new meetup uh, popped up in my feed, like probably with you guys, marketing automation and AI, I said, ooh, that sounds interesting. And the title was intriguing and the speaker was Elizabeth Quintanilla and I knew her, so I said, I'm going. So afterwards, Fernando and I talked for a minute. He needed some help and asked me to be co-organizer. a lot of help. What? I need a lot of help. Well, and so I happily jumped on this because I was looking to help with a meetup and this was AI is my thing. So here we go with my intro. So since then we've become good friends. I've learned a lot about content marketing and category design. He's also an author. He's an incredibly talented nonfiction writer. He's super smart and a great speaker. He's been a content marketer since he was nine years old, ever since he wrote and distributed a newspaper to, um, about family news to his cousins, uncles, aunts, and his grandmother, who encouraged him to write. Fernando also started the first blog about content marketing in Spanish, and he also wrote the first book about marketing for Latin America, source, Latin American outsourcing companies to help them enter the U.S. market. Fernando's mantra is, if you feel like you're giving away too much information, you're on the right track. That means give away all your best information so you can add value to the lives of your audience, and they will come back for more. Um, he's the founder of Custom Software Marketing <laughs> Institute, and he's writing his second book, Start Up Book, Write a Book, Design a Category about how you can design your own industry category by writing a book and become a category leader. Without further ado, let's welcome my friend, Fernando Labastida. That's, that's a really interesting description. I wonder if, if you can introduce me to this guy. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like hearing about me, myself, in a third party. It's really hard to identify with myself that way. Um, this is going to have definitely an AI component, um, but what I did want to do is I wanted to start off with a little bit of marketing strategy and then get into how I've incorporated AI into writing a book that I'm writing right now for my client. I'm ghostwriting a book for him. He's a, a software development outsourcer for Mexico and, you know, try and share uh, a few tips and tricks with you all. And I like the fact that so many of you all are, are innovators. You guys are, y'all are creators of 
new technologies, new, I would say essentially new categories of, of, of software, hardware, etc. So I think this is going to be right up your alley over here. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping. This is my website. Um, this is a preview of a book that I'm writing right now. She, Sharon talked about my second book. I would love for you all to be some of the first buyers of my book when, I, when it launches in late, eight, late February, early March. And so the, when it goes live, it's going to be actually available for, uh, for zero dollars for the first five days on Amazon. And if you guys could uh, sign up for my mailing list here at customsoftwaremarketing.com, etc., you guys will get the early preview for the book. And that way I'm, you know, I'm hoping to kind of uh, get Amazon to put me up into the um, bestseller status in a particular genre that I choose. Okay. One of the things about AI that I've noticed is that AI lets us stand back a little bit and think. And I love this quote by Christopher Lockhead. He is really one of uh, the founders of this whole category design uh, uh, category. Uh, he's, they call themselves the category pirates. And he says, thinking about thinking is the most important kind of thinking. You know, so you know, the, the great thing about artificial intelligence and especially generative AI is it allows us to sort of offload a lot of that sort of like manual labor of writing and creating plans and and um, and, and creating marketing calendars, etc. And allows us to kind of step back and really think and question the paradigm with which we have lived our whole working adult lives, right? So that's what thinking about thinking is. Um, and then what is marketing? There are so many definitions out there of what marketing is. My favorite definition by far is this one by Tim Grawl. He's a, 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 mar a book marketing expert. And he talks about how it's the act of building long-lasting relationships with people and uh, you focus on being relentlessly helpful and adding value to their lives. And that's it. It's not about being spammy. It's not about you know, begging them for the order. It's not about tricking them, etc. It's about creating a long-term relationship with people, you know, not going for the quick sale, although a quick sale would be good if you're you know, starving. But uh, it's, it's about creating that long-term relationship and adding value to their lives, right? So just think about that in the context of what, uh, what I'm going to uh, discuss with you here. So, like I said, the first part is really going to kind of be about the, the strategy, about the mentality, about the, the, the concept of category design. Then I'm going to get into sort of the nuts and bolts and show you what I'm doing with, with uh, Eduardo um, from a company in Mexico called We Are the Robots. But, so have you ever read a book that essentially would change the industry or made you think differently about the industry? Yeah, well, what was that book for you? I can't you? remember the exact title, but it was the customer service book that was written by the Nordstroms. Okay. About the Nordstrom customer service way. It was completely different, right? Because customer, because totally Nordstrom is just so unique. so unique when it comes to customers. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. I, like, I hadn't heard about that example. Anybody else? Sharon, I think you raised your hand there too, no, right? I didn't. Sorry. No, I was oh. too busy. You were videoing, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, to me it was a book called Get Content, Get Customers uh, by Joe Polizzi. Joe Polizzi was the one who founded um, the Content Marketing Institute and he kind of coined the term, he didn't coin the term content marketing, but he sort of established the category, right? And so let's talk a little bit about uh, books that essentially change the industry, that establish new industry categories. And that for me is The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. And then Peter Drucker was a prolific writer. I think he wrote more than 20 or 30 books uh, about management. And he is really the, the, like the father of the whole management category, right? Because before Peter Drucker came into existence, before he, he was born in Austria and he came here in the 1940s and he did a bunch of work over at Yale, et cetera. But before Peter Drucker came, management was just sort of like this command and control thing at factories, right? There was no science, no term management consulting. There was no such thing as the practice of management until Peter Drucker came around and he talked about um, for things like knowledge worker, knowledge work, you know, doing things that are effective versus things that are efficient. He kind of introduced this whole vocabulary which uh, I'm going to talk about in a minute, you know, this whole thing called languaging, you know, languaging, adding 
terms to the English language or to whatever language that didn't exist before to describe new concepts, right? So Peter Drucker, I think, is one of the pioneers when it comes to category design, and he did it through his you know, prolific writing habit of writing books all over the place. And then you have all these books. I'm, since I'm a marketer, I like to take, a, you know, get examples of marketing books. You know, you have the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one-to-one future by Don Rep, uh, Peppers and Martha Rogers. This is kind of the precursor to the whole CRM revolution and to the whole personalization and marketing. They, again, established this new category of personalized marketing. Seth Godin, to me, is, is really the the, the, the pioneer when it comes to digital marketing, uh, permission marketing. He, again, when, when he wrote this book, mar what was marketing? Interruption. It was interruption advertising. It was interrupting your, you know, watching Star Trek with the commercial for, you know, uh, for dishwashing liquid. You know, instead, when the internet came along and he saw things changing and he kind of, he came, came and, and named it. He, he named and claimed this thing called permission marketing, which is now the basis of everything that we do in digital marketing, right? It's creating content that's so good that people will give you permission to, yeah, I'll, I'll give you permission. I'll subscribe to your newsletter uh, or I agree to receive your texts because I like what you're, you're talking about. So he introduced these terms to the, to, into the vocabulary of what we use today. Inbound marketing. This is an example of a software company, HubSpot. HubSpot founders Brian Halligan and Dharmesh Shah, they, they didn't invent all the practices that are involved with inbound marketing. That already existed. You know, there are people that were creating content and asking you to come and join their funnels, etc. But what they did is they created this whole uh, methodology around it and they kind of coined the term inbound marketing and everything related to it with this book, with their famous blog, with their conference called Inbound that they hold every year up in, in Boston. And they took things that were really more focused on the B2C market and they brought it to B2B uh, with uh, inbound marketing. So they coined these terms. They, they designed a new category. You know, and you, we can go on and on, right? So Customer Success is another software company that they, uh, they saw what was going on with the whole SaaS industry. You know, when SaaS came along, it was like now you actually had to provide good service and actually provide, deliver a good software because people had to renew their, their subscriptions. You know, before with Siebel systems and, you know, all those on-premise systems, there's legendary stories of, of implementations gone horribly wrong because it was like, you know, you buy a license fee and maybe you want to buy a maintenance contract for 20%, but still, there wasn't that incentive to keep uh, people going. And so this thing called the customer success manager came along and these guys at Gainsight, um, Gainsight is a software that's, that's it's essentially, it's a, it's a software platform for con customer success managers. They wrote the book about it, right? So they, they, they invented the category, they designed the category, and they, and they created a whole s vocabulary around it, right? So this is a little bit about uh, what I'm talking about over here. What, what I wanted to propose to you as founders of companies, especially those who are founding new technologies like, you know, the, the video AI, in, you know, interview software, you know, or, or the little printed copper hardware, you know, that Yoshi has, is think about what you're doing as you're not competing with other people. You know, you're not one of many, but you're just better, faster, uh, more expensive or cheaper or whatever you're in a category all to yourself, right? And so, and I'm gonna get into the reason why you wanna design your own category, first of all, but I think that is the thing that you wanna think about as a founder. You, you know, you wanna think about designing your own category and then creating the thought leadership content around that, encapsulate it into a, a book, and then, you know, use that as sort of like the starting point to create content that, that really evangelizes the category, right? And then I'm gonna, t I'm gonna show you what I'm doing with my client to use AI to not only write the book, but also to come up with industry vocabulary, industry terms to describe his uh, new category, et cetera. But this is, this is the rough outline of the book. I have more detailed outline um, within the book itself. So what is category design? Really recommend you get this book. If you're in technology, and maybe you're a technical founder, or maybe you're a marketer with a technology company, or even if you're not a technology person, I would recommend getting this book and actually getting all the books published by the Category Pirates. But in the 22 Laws of Category Design, um, 
Chris Lockhead, Eddie Yoon, Nicholas Cole, they talk about that category design is about the exponentially different. Okay? It's about creating different futures by creating new and different business categories. And emphasis is mine over here. Category design is not about competing, it's about creating, right? So again, it's, it's about being different. And you know, think about uh, what Starbucks did. Um, they, they essentially designed a new category of, of coffee. This is not a coffee shop like in the traditional sense of the word that we used to know it back in the 70s and 80s. You know, a coffee shop was when you'd go in, it's like more like a diner, and you'd go in and you'd get your uh, BLT or your bacon egg and cheese, bacon egg breakfast with toast and grits, and then you'd get coffee, you know. I want to get a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, a coffee, sh now a coffee house is a different thing. And, you know, um, uh, Howard Schultz, who actually bought Starbucks from the original founders back in the 80s, he had done a trip to Italy to Milan and saw how much a part of the Italian culture coffee was. It was just, you know, a coffee house was a place where, you know, families would gather, or you'd get together and talk politics, or you'd talk about football, Inter Milan, and, and you know, all those different teams. You know, and what was Maradona doing in Napoli or whatever. You know, so he decided he wanted to bring that concept to the United States. And so they designed this new, you know, we call, we, we, now we call coffees grande, tall, and venti. Right? <laughs> and now we're paying $5 for coffee when we used to pay like 99 cents at a gas station for coffee. It's a, you know, who would have thought about paying $5 for a cup of coffee if it wasn't for Starbucks kind of designing this new inventory? Now, they didn't write a book about it, but that's kind of like what it is. And the, the whole basis of, of, of category design, and I didn't include this in my slides, but when you identify the problem, and the problem that you identify is something that hasn't been solved before, it's, it's like a uh, maybe a, a, a chronic problem that your market has, but they just live with the pain because they don't think that there's ever going to be a solution to it, and then you identify it, you name it. If you identify that problem to your customers, all of a sudden they associate you with the problem and they say, wow, okay, we're going to this company. So think about, um, this is kind of a, such an obvious example, I almost am embarrassed to use it, but it's like Uber, right? So. Uber identified the problem of, of taxis. We thought we would ever, always, forever and ever have to use, you know, you think about the kind of grumpy New York cab driver or standing in the rain trying to hail a cab and they're not stopping for you, et cetera. You know, just the kind of like the unreliability and the sort of, like we didn't know that there was a, that was a problem until they pointed it out and they said, well, yeah, that is true. You know, we don't have to ride in a dirty taxi anymore with a cab driver who's a little shifty and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they kind of created the solution. They named the problem. People said, yeah, that is a problem. And okay, so that's, that's kind of like the concept. What, why design a category? Well, the category pirates, you know, in their, in their books and uh, in the, in the research they've done on the marketplace is they, they have identified the fact that category leaders, you know, people who design a category and maintain an active role in becoming the leader of, of maintain, staying as the leader of the category, they're able to capture 76% of the, of the category economics, okay? So that means market valuation, market share, um, attention from the press and the, and the media, uh, et cetera. Whereas the other competitors who come into the market, they have to kind of fight it out for the rest of the 24%. Now HubSpot made a grave error when they started inbound marketing because then after that they kind of abandoned inbound marketing and decided to kind of go all in into the CRM space which is a space dominated by Salesforce. Right, so now they're fighting over the 24% scraps left over by Salesforce because they, for some reason, they abandoned inbound marketing. And I spoke to Christopher Lockett about this and he's, he's like, yeah, they blew it. They had a good thing going when they had inbound marketing and then they decided to go into CRM. So, um, so companies that create new categories or successfully re redesign existing ones create exponentially more value for both shareholders and the entire market. I think a lot of VCs now are really starting to ask companies that are, that are coming to them for, um, for funding, you know, what's your category design strategy? You know, they want to be able to see if you can have some kind of a moat around your company if you're able to design a category and, you know, maintain that 76% um, value thing. You know, it's like when I think about category design, I think about this sort of like the, the, uh, the, the marketing automation space. Um, 785 companies all doing marketing automation. And there's different subcategories, et cetera. But it's just, you know, you're, 
your eyes start to glaze over when you see all the logos all competing in the marketing automation space. You know, you don't want to be one of those people who are trying to be better, faster, cheaper, more elegant, more luxurious, or what have you. You know, you want to have, you want to be the category of one. Um, and then again, what you want to do is you want to market the category, you know, not your brand. And that's what HubSpot did so successfully at the beginning. They were focusing almost 100% of their marketing on talking about inbound marketing. They really almost didn't talk about their own software. You know, what and, and what happens when they talk about the category, the category builds up, you know, people start to recognize it, the analysts, Forrester, Gartner, et cetera, start to recognize the category, and then they associate the company who invented the category as the category leader. The same thing, uh, Terminus did this. Um, uh, what's his name? San Sangram Vajray, who was the CMO and one of the co-founders of Terminus. They didn't design the ABM category, the account-based marketing category, but they essentially hijacked it and took it over because the original company, and I can't even remember who invented ABM, fell asleep at the wheel. And they kind of became the owners of it because they created this thing called Flip My Funnel. Flip My Funnel was a conference, it was a podcast, it was a blog, they actually wrote a book about it. And Flip My Funnel become, became this community where they talked about the category, right? So they talked about the category of ABM and flipping your funnel around, and they became the beneficiary of it. Terminus uh, is an account-based advertising platform that's sort of like the leader in that, in that space. Okay, so um, let's get right into, um, oh, this is, does anybody know who Roy Smith is? I was just there. You were just there? Two weekends ago. Uh, what, what's the name of the place with the um, up there? It's just the Wizards Academy. It's the Wizard Academy. Okay, yeah, so Roy Smith owns this, um, all this beautiful acreage out in the, in the hill country, out beyond um, the famous barbecue place. What's the name? Oh, Salt Lake, beyond the Salt Lake, right? It's called the Wizard Academy, and it's actually a nonprofit. You can, you can actually get married there. For free, you just pay a you know like a, a reservation fee of two hundred and fifty dollars in this beautiful chapel, and they have this thing that looks like a, ca a castle from the days of uh, of um, of Cervantes, right? And um, you know they have a, the Dulcinea chapel. Anyway, so what he said was, "They who control the vocabulary control the industry." You know, very very savvy words from a local um, Austinite, right? And so you have. Things like conversion rate optimization, bounce rate persuasion architecture that were coined by these guys, Jeffrey and Brian Eisenberg. Again, two of the pioneers of internet marketing from New York City, call Austin home now. Okay, so let's get into my client. And this was, a, this was a, I was able to achieve this for my client with uh, ChatGPT. Um, my client is a, um, they're a, a software outsourcing company from Mexico and they kind of specialize in the retail sector. And so the book that I'm helping them create, I'm helping him write, is called AI um, uh, Revolutionary, no, Revolutionizing Retail Inventory Management with AI. So it's all about inventory management and how to avoid things like the short toilet paper shortage uh, during the pandemic and the baby formula shortage, et cetera. You know, so how can retailers either avoid shortages of very popular items or how can they avoid overstocking with things because maybe an over-anxious or an over-eager purchasing manager bought something they thought was going to sell like hotcakes and it just ended up being a big dud and it's gathering dust on the shelf and it's, you know, there's all this carrying costs that are affecting the bottom line. So he's talking about how to apply AI for inventory management for retailers. And so we're working on the book and I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you in detail step by step how I'm helping him write this book. But one of the things that we did with the book is we have to come up with new vocabulary because this is a new, this is a new category. AI inventory management is completely new, you know. And so one of the things we did was we, we fed, um, I think it was Claude actually. So we used ChatGPT and Claude.ai uh, to come up with the, the content for the book. But what we wanted to do was to come up with vocabulary that described various parts of the inventory management thing. And so I, I really like what they came up with. Shelf intelligence, leveraging computer vision. Computer vision is a, is a new technology used by, Ada, by Amazon and by Google um, that essentially turns cameras into, you know, to, to smart uh, lenses, right? That can actually recognize 
thing, is right? So leveraging computer vision and IoT sensors to gain unparalleled real-time visibility into product levels, movements, and trends, etc. Smart stocking, inventory harmony, all these things are things that we're going to be infusing into the book, and hopefully we're going to turn this into commonly used terms, you know, by retailers when they talk about how they're going to now leverage inventory AI to, to, to manage their inventory management, right? So this is an example of this, I'm now making the transition from the talk about category design to the talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And this is a little, this is a cover that Sharon designed for my clients uh, for the book that we're writing. I just didn't expect it. That's a designer too. Yeah, it's, Sharon is a fantastic graphic designer. This is what she came up with. We're going to make a few changes because the client changed his logo. Okay. So let's get into the, I think this is the part that uh, most of us were looking forward to. What I did with my client, this is a, a graphic that I stole from um, Dennis Yu, uh, but I think it sort of says my point very well. What I did with my client is he already, the good thing is that when he approached me to help him with his US marketing efforts, I said, well look, I've kind of changed my direction. I'm not really doing lead generation I'm doing. I'm using the book as a as a market hack, right? So let's. We're using a book as a market hack to design a new category and to help you generate leads and business in the U.S. market. And he says, "Perfect. I already have a book in mind. I already have an outline. So it was perfect. We didn't even have to go through the whole process of outlining. But we did use AI to enrich in his outline. But what he did essentially was he already knew what he wanted to talk about. He he has this down pat. But the thing is, his English isn't perfect. Um, and so what we did was we did this thing where we took audio, long form content. What I did with him is we actually scheduled 10 recording sessions over Zoom. We did Zoom calls. Each, each of the recording sessions was for a different chapter, right? So his book is going to have 10 chapters. Each recording session was for like chapter, you know, the introduction, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it was all in Spanish. And I'll get into how we did that in a minute, right? And then what we did was, we instead of all these things, we used a script to um, transcribe the audio. Does anybody here use the script, or have they heard? OK. The script is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, perfect. So we used a script uh, to transcribe the audio. And then I used ChatGPT to translate it. So I don't, know what I don't know if you've seen any translations from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, but I think it's pretty good. And I actually had to go in. I mean, it's really good. So we, I translated the, uh, the complete transcription of all the different recordings we did from English, from Spanish into English. And then what we did was um, we turned the, the raw transcripts translated into English, and I used um, various prompts to turn that into the different chapters, okay, which I'll show you in a minute. Let me just see if there's anything else here that I wanted to show you. So you can do this with speaking gigs, you can do this with podcast interviews, lead generation, um, et cetera. I mean, you could do this for a full 200 page, 60,000 word book, or you could do this with, uh, with an ebook or a mini book, et cetera. Just take all your audios and uh, turn them into a book with AI. Okay, so let's get into the nuts and bolts about what I did with him. So first of all, this is what I, this is the, the, the interface for Descript, right? And so I actually just recently, just the other day, I actually interviewed Ann Hanley. Ann Hanley was really? the founder. Yeah, she was, I, I was relent, like, you know, she wouldn't respond to me until I finally kind of messaged her on Instagram and sent her a couple of reminders on, e on email and she finally said, oh, great, yeah, I'll do it. But you're limited to 30 minutes, Fernando. So I got a great information packed interview with Ann Hanley, but basically, the, the audio that uh, I got from Zoom, I just put it into uh, Descript, and Descript does a perfect job of just, you know, um, uh, transcribing it for me. The other thing about Descript, you know, this is kind of a, an as a side note, is that you can do this with video as well. And if you want to edit video, instead of using, you know, the traditional video editing timeline that you get with, you know, Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro or what have you, with Descript, you can actually edit the video by copying or by deleting uh, or rearranging words like you're doing it with a Word document, right? 
but then when you when you edit the word the, the 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 transcribed text like you would any kind of word document it edits the video so it's really cool so you can get rid of the ums and ahs etc and then the, the ai within descript yeah it's really cool That's so good. <laughs> the ai uh, within descript can do a mass delete of all the ms and the ahs and the ums etc so but what we did with with eduardo eduardo ortiz is I got all the, the transcripts using Descript and um, translated it. And then let me go into, so let me just go into this one. So did anybody here go to the Zachariah Stratford presentation where he talked about writing a book with AI? Yeah, in fact, Sharon was the one who introduced me to Zachariah Stratford. If you want to learn how to write a complete book with AI, not even using audio, I would say go to Zachariah Stratford, and I think it's called the One Book Millionaire, Millionaire Challenge. challenge. Or a challenge. Yeah, so he has a free challenge, and then if you want to pay a bunch of money to have them ghost write your book for you, or if you want to like get all the insider scoops about how to do it, he can help you do that. So I actually took his challenge and I was in his mastermind for a while. So I took a lot of the core concepts, the core prompting from Zachariah Stratford. And now he's actually encapsulated that into several custom GPTs that he's created for writing a book. But I felt like as though it didn't work for my particular case in which what we were doing is the customer, the clients already had all the knowledge. He spoke the book into existence and all I had to do was then just turn that book into well-organized text that sounded good when you read it. And it can't be 100% AI. I mean, I had to go in and do some human editing because sometimes, you know, if you don't tell, if you're not explicitly telling AI exactly the voice and the tone that you want, it's gonna have that, my sister calls it that, the language that reeks of AI. You know, like the, in the world of whatever, whatever, you know, it's like that typical way it starts. But what I did here was, so I said, chat, you will help me write the book, Revolutionizing Retail Inventory Management with AI, a strategic guide. Right now, I need you to write chapter three, The Pioneering Power of Computer Vision and Retail. Okay. And so I gave them the transcript. And so this is the transcript for chapter three. Now, the, the only drawback with ChatGPT, at least back, uh, this was a few months ago when I did this, was that it can only ingest a certain length of, uh, of text, right? And so for that, I mean, Claude GPT, Claude.ai is a lot better at ingesting large quantities of text and being able to understand it and then kind of, you know, give you whatever you want based on, you know, you know 10,000, 12, 15,000 words, right? With, with chat GPT, you kind of have to do it piece by piece, right? So I said, you know, just go ahead and tell me you read it. And then based on the transcript, here is the outline, right? So what I did here was my client had already created an outline for all 10 chapters. I'm sorry, who, who said I read it? Oh, ChatGPT, right? Oh, okay. So what I did was I told ChatGPT at the very beginning. Just to say. I said, right now I need you to read, to write chapter three. I will paste the transcript of an interview I conducted with the book author. Please just read the transcript and say I read it. Don't write anything other than I read it. So I actually had to explicitly give him, give him that expression. This is something that I learned from Zachariah Stratford. Because what I want them to do is I wanted them, what was that? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, why do you need this step? What I, what I needed to, to do is because it's sort of like a, a multiple step process where I needed to paste the information, paste the transcript from the interview, and then what, the, what, what I wanted them to do is two things. I wanted uh, ChatGPT to do a more detailed outline for the chapter, and then from the detailed outline, then I wanted it to use the raw transcript I had already previously post pasted, and then use the new outline to then write, I'm sorry, to write each ch to write the chapter section by section. So I actually didn't get ChatGPT to write the whole chapter in one go because I wouldn't do that. I wanted to do it section by section. So each chapter has like about four sections, okay? And so my client had actually come up with an outline for the, um, for the whole book, 10 chapters, but each chapter he only had three different sections, right? And if, you've, if you and if you all have read a, a, a book recently, you know that most chapters and most nonfiction business books don't have just three sections. There's a few books that are very short, have very short chapters. So what I wanted uh, ChatGPT to do to was to, to just uh, enrich 
each chapter with a detailed outline, right? So what I did after this was I said, okay, I, I, I pasted the transcript for chapter three, and I said, okay, based on that transcript, I'm gonna paste a basic outline I came up with. Please give me an enhanced outline for this chapter. Here's the basic outline, and then, you know, Introduction to Computer Vision Technology, Role of AWS Panorama, and Google Retail Watch, Enhancing Real-Time Inventory Tracking and Data Visibility. So then it got into like all the stuff that Eduardo told me in the, in the interview, and it gave me this very detailed outline. And I was, you know, sometimes ChatGPT will give you stuff that's like fantasy. You know, everybody's heard about the fantasy stuff. Yeah. What was that? Hallucinations. Hello, hallucinations, et cetera. But I went back and I double checked and I actually checked with Eduardo and he said, yeah, this is spot on. So with this one, because we're actually feeding it every, all the information, we're not asking, the, asking it to come up with the stuff, it, it, was, it was very accurate, right? So then I said, okay, based on the transcript and the following section of the outline, so I'm referring to the original transcript that I, that I had previously pasted and the following section of the outline. So what I did was I took the first section of the outline, right? So the introduction. So here's the introduction and here's the detailed outline of the introduction. So I just fed it section by section and it came up with, um, and, and this one, okay, so it made a mistake here and it did, gave me a very light first section. I said, chat, let's do this again. Make sure the section is at least 500 words. So that's one of the things. You have to kind of tell ChatGPT exactly how many words you want. I mean. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the prompts for some of the custom GPTs, they're very detailed. And I could have done this with, a, um, with my own custom GPT. I did this prior to custom GPTs. Um, so I think what I need to do is develop custom GPTs for turning transcripts into books. But then it, it, it did a great job for me, right? So here it is, He's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's the text for the first section, then I just continue doing that with all the subsequent sections. And it gave me, I mean, really accurate text. Now, the thing about the, thing about the book is that everything about the book came from Eduardo's brain, right? So, and if, and if, again, if you read a business book, it's not just stream of consciousness from the author. You know, the, the book has to be enhanced with, you know, external sources, articles, data, you know, so what I did was I actually went in after the fact, and he'd, he, his wife works for Gartner, so we had access to some, to some free reports. I mean, we didn't want to use stuff that, was, that you, you had to get paid, but he didn't pay for it, you know, so we wanted to be ethical about it. But she had all in one place all the free reports that we would have to go searching for on Google anyway. So I went in and did it. But what I did also was I would find, um, let me see, I found... some external, okay, here we go. So we wanted to talk about Zara because Zara is an example, it's a, it's a fast fashion retailer based out of Spain and they're, you know, everyone, who here has bought clothes from Zara? For, okay, I have too. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, they're a great model of a company that uses AI for their inventory management. You know, they always have the, the latest and greatest stuff. They never run out of uh, the popular items, and you know they they stay lean and mean, and they're you know very profitable, a very successful company. And so what I wanted to do was to in, you know include some of the stat stuff about Zara, right? So what I did was I said you know chat write a magazine style narrative driven driven summary of this case study about Zara. So what I I did wanted to have it written in a way that was like attractive and and you know, would keep people's uh, interest. So I, I, I found that my experimentation, that if I say narrative style, it'll, it'll write something that was pretty compelling, right? So I just, I, I, I copied and pasted a fairly dry, um, you know, kind of almost like an academic uh, paper written case study about Zara. <laughs> And it still, it is still used as this language that kind of reeks of AI, right? In the fast-paced world of fashion where trends come and go, but, it's, but it, it gave me a pretty good summary and I had to go in and take away a lot of the wordiness. And you can go, you can implement that in the prompts, right? You can say, what, what I did for, for most of the chapters of the book is I said, please, um, 
I took some of the concepts from Strunk and White's uh, The Elements of Style, right? You know, remove uh, unnecessary words, be as direct as possible, be as concise as possible. And I use that in the instructions. I want to see if I can find that over here so that it can kind of remove these, you know, these kind of corny uh, turns of phrase that, that is so it's kind of a signature of ChatGPT. Let me see, I saw something here where it said a rewrite of chapter five. Here we go. I do that a lot. I go in and ask it to rewrite results. Right. Right. So how do you, so how do, you do that? Yeah. A, a lot of what you just said, I ask it to be more direct, concise, take out any um, uh, unnecessary words right. or uh, slang, you know, when it starts being wordy. Or, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, because you know, if you, I, I go in with my, I'm, I'm a writer myself, I go in with my editor's eye, and I'm just removing so many words from the original um, stuff that ChatGPT does. You can tell it about to sound so AI too, that it actually goes and rewrites it a little better. Yeah, oh, okay, there you go, I like that, okay. Don't sound so AI, it's like, okay. Do you know what I do? I say, write like a guy. Oh, there you go. I'm serious, <laughs> to get a different uh, writing style from... From like a female or them, and it does it. It's like right, right like a guy. That's what I tell it, and it's so funny. I say for them, right in the conversational style. Uh, right in the conversational style. Right, exactly. What I what I started telling it, and I can't. I don't think I can find. I can't see the example right here. I don't think I said it here, but I said right in a in an austere, uh, dry, <laughs> austere, dry, direct. You know, uh, uh, no frills language. That's what I said. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, do you use any references for a tone of voice? Uh, like, for example, write uh, in the style of, I don't know, someone. Yeah, so I, I've, I've used that before, but what I've done is, um, what I've, because I've written so much over the last, you know, 12, 13 years. As I uh, actually pre, there's other examples here. I've got such a long timeline of stuff, but where I will just feed him, feed chat uh, examples of my of my written work, mm -hmm. and and I said, can you write? And this is this is the style of Fernando Lavacita. And so that's one of the things I learned from Zachariah Stratford. If you come up with a style that you've already written, you say, you know, please read this and and um, call this the Fernando Labastida style, right? Or the Sharon DeCaro style. And then with each subsequent thing that you ask it to do, you put it in, a, in, bra in, um, in what is it, the straight brackets. And you said, please write this in the Fernando Labastida style. Or you could do things like write in the style of whatever, right? So um, in the, in the- um, I did care, I said write in the style of Christopher Lockett. I wanted to see, Hey ho, whatever it did, you know the category pirates, and I, it, it took that reference, and then I said, I oh, forget it. Yeah, yeah but exactly. But Some... I just wanted to see mm -hmm. and use those tones. You know, I'll try Oprah, I'll try Rogan, I'll try, I'll do a lot of Seth Godin. You know. I mean, yeah, yeah, so you can. So Zachariah Stratford and his mastermind and his free chat challenges will teach you how to say, okay, he'll, they'll ask you, he'll ask you the question, what is, who's your favorite writer? Nonfiction writer or fiction writer, and you'll say, "Okay, this is my fiction writer. Please describe this style." Okay, so it describes the style. Then, who's your favorite uh, movie actor? Please describe their style. And then, who's your favorite whatever? And then, at the at the end of it, it describes the three different styles of your favorite author, writer, um, you know, writer, actor, um, whatever. Then you said, "Okay, chat. Combine these three styles." these three writing styles and call it the, the Jane Smith writing style, right? And then you put it in, in straight brackets and it turns into, uh-oh, que paso? Uh, okay. Okay, so what did I say in this thing over here? Rewrite the following text in an orderly, well-written chapter. Make sure to write 2,200 words. Write it in four sessions. So this is another thing that I learned. If you wanted to write, if you want ChatGPT to write a whole chapter for you and you want it to be a certain amount of words, you could tell it to write it in uh, 
in four sections of, I don't know, in this case it was 550 words. Write, write the first 550 words and ask me if you'd like to proceed, I'll say proceed, blah, blah, blah. And so then it, so then it goes like this. So, I, uh, so then I, I pasted the transcript for chapter five and then it gave me the first 500 words and it didn't give me 500 words. <laughs> Not very good counting the number of words because I've tried that a lot too. Yeah, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't very good. So, so this is what I did with, with, the, with the transcript. But at the end of the day, I actually was able to hack it uh, in a way that I just spent a lot of time doing this, which is kind of defeats the purpose of, it, of AI saving you time. But I think what, 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 I, what I think was great was that it's, it's what it saves you is a lot of time and money from actually hiring third party transcription people and, and copywriters to turn it into a well written uh, manuscript, right? And so the end result is I went in and I did a lot of editing, and the end result was, a, was it was actually a really good. Um, my client gave two of the chapters that were in Google Docs to a prospect of his in the United States. And the prospect said, I can't believe, this is so great, I can't wait until the, the book comes out. Okay, so. Um, now, when it comes to the, um, we were trying to come up with alternative titles for the book. Okay. And so this is where Claude AI comes in handy. What Claude AI is great at, so what I did was I pasted, what I did was I used Claude AI for the introduction of the book. And whenever you read an introduction for a nonfiction book, um, a lot of, I would say a, a, a good majority of nonfiction books in the introduction, they will give you an overview of the upcoming chapters, right? So in chapter one, we're gonna talk about this. So that's what I wanted to do with his book. So what I did was I decided to use Claude for this, and so I, I gave Claude each one of the chapters, so the introduction, and it gave me a really good summary of the introduction, then I pasted the, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it gave me really good summaries, one paragraph summaries of each one of the chapters, which I included in the introduction. And then I asked, me, I asked it to write, and the thing about Claude is it doesn't have that kind of corny uh, language that ChatGPT does. It's a, it's a little bit more direct and concise. But what I did later on is I said, okay, here are 10, you know, Claude, can you come up with 10 potential titles and subtitles for the book? So it, it remembers, so I did this like about a week after I had pasted all the chapters. And it's still, you know, because it's part of that same string, that same conversation, I said, can you please analyze all the previous chapters and give me 10 potential titles for the book, right? So now that's the next step with the client. Uh, is to look at these titles or to come up with maybe 10 more or even 30 or 20, 20 or 30 more titles for the book. Inventory intelligence, harnessing AI for optimal retail operations, AI driven inventory, the future of data powered retail subtitle, uh, subtitle mastering demand forecasting, shelf analytics and hyper personalization, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it did a really good job. Um, some of them were off the market, some of them were right on the money, okay? I have a question. Yes. So was that, you're going to change the title from the other one. I mean, yes. You guys had talked about it. So this is what you've come up with? Yeah, this is, this okay. is what... I've, so far. Yeah, so far. And so... I like uh, short title. I mean, I feel, you know, that revolution thing. Yeah. Like a little walk. But, you know... Yeah, if you, if you think about the book Atomic Habits, it's just a two-word title, and then I he know. has a, a detailed yeah. subtitle. Yeah. Or what's, what's another good short what title? What about Shelf Supply? I really like that. That's a three interesting title, Shelf Supremacy. Wait a minute, three or six? Shelf Supremacy. Decode Your Inventory. Which one? Which one? Decode, Decode Your Inventory. That's another one that's good. I like Shelf Supremacy. Where's that? It's number, where did Oops. I get? Where'd it go? Nine. Nine. Shelf Supremacy. I'm I don't nine. like Unleash the Power of AI. I just like Shelf Supremacy. What does that mean? It's a new category. I would kind of like to have AI in the title. Oh, okay. With well, AI-driven AI inventory, the future of data powered retail. I don't know, but I decode your inventory. Well, decode is kind of. That's why I like three. Decode your inventory and unlocking profitability with AI. Yeah, it's stop and there. Practice, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. Three. I three. Mean, three is a three just gives it. It gives you everything. It gives yeah. your decoding, your inventory, your AI. 
again, practical strategies. I love it. Okay, Red cool. Baron, that's it. That's the only one you need. I'm going to tell Ed that we crowdsourced the, the choice for his uh, oh, in a funny uh, lead up. I still like Shelf Supremacy. I think it's interesting. Shelf Supremacy. Because it's like a new category. Yeah. It's so new. You can just say Shelf Supremacy with AI. Look, look ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, because I, we can combine like all the yeah, different she things. She loves it too. See, I yeah. like decode. Oh, and you can unleash instead of like in front, unleash the power of AI. Self with supremacy with AI. Unlock, unleash. You know, I don't think that's a word I've ever heard. A term, shelf supremacy, of you in the retail space? Shelf supremacy. I don't know. But um, Ed is the expert when it comes oh, to inventory yeah. management. I'm just helping him write the book okay. and design the category. <laughs> but, okay, so any questions so far yes. about the book writing process? Yes. Yeah. So, Fernando, when you publish this, do you have to say it was written by AI with AI support? What do you... That's a good question, and I think this is going to be uh, it's, it's going to be an ongoing debate. I don't think you have to say that. I mean, I think no, when, when like if I was going to publish it, self publish it, I would have to say it. You do in mm -hmm. Amazon, he, but he has not used. It's no different all than it. spell check. You don't say that you. Oh, it does ask. <laughs> <laughs> if I publish it on Amazon, it's asking. What does it say exactly? What about if you? What about if it's, 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 it's extensively it's edited by? No, I just said. I'm curious. I mean, I can look it up. Okay. But it does say it. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I think that if there's a certain percentage of AI versus human, like if there's a certain percentage of human content in there, you wouldn't have to say that, right? Uh huh. Because I think, because I would say that about 20. Would you know anything about that as an attorney? They're going to start watermarking all this. They're already started watermarking a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. just through the back end of stuff. So that, is a great copyright yeah. question that probably well, is not even defined at this point. Work. But, but, I, but I think that in this case, since the... It in a way that's non-intrusive. So, but I think that in this case, since the content is coming from That's what I'm wondering, because the person is... Yeah, it's like... But at the same time, yeah, there was... All, we're, all we're using AI for is to organize it. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's coming up with, it's not going out there and we're grabbing, asking, you know, right? 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 We're, we're, asking. we're actually, yeah, so, exactly, so the, the, the written part, I would say writing in, in, in quotation marks because it was spoken on my client, That's, that would be a good uh, lawyer question. I mean, the content is coming directly from the source, which is my client, and he, they're speaking the book to me, and all we're doing is using AI to either organize it or to, like, maybe rewrite third-party sources just like a real writer would rewrite something so I don't know I think that's a good that's a great question I'm glad you brought it up uh, something to, to consider I was not planning on doing that mm -hmm. myself just because of the fact that the, con the content is 100% original from from Eduardo um, so they, when I looked they said like we're gonna check if you if you use the AI so they said yeah, I'm when, 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 when they say they the check, was that, would that mean, are they checking to I'm see what exactly would be the original source is. for it? Okay, let's see. So, or if it's like zero GPT or something where they're going and trying to detect what portion is AI written. Mm -hmm. but I wonder if they probably just have even just detectors that would read the text. And, uh, and just interpret from the use of the words and the, and the sentence structure, like et cetera, or, yeah. or from... It's like so, that's you know, like the word zero AI. GPT Huh. I'm not sure exactly like how it is a language model can detect automation. Yeah. So we have we use it on our models that we actually implement it on the resume. Mm -hmm. Duplicate people copy paste. Uh -huh. Right, okay. We are we are I didn't think resume written by human being or mm -hmm. yeah. See and I, so I I think that this would so pass that test. Yeah. I think this would pass that test because we're um, for, for, for when it comes to like external sources that I'm using like the re, when I wrote, rewrote the case study on Zara, we're actually adding um, a source to it, right? So we're, we're sourcing it in the book and the, and the appendix, and the and the and 100 percent of the actual content from the book is 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 from from my client. So I don't think that there's we can say that there's any duplicate out there. 
I don't know. It's it's interesting. Oh, sure. So when when the model goes through, it checks the language styles. Right. Yeah. That's one false negative trigger. Also, another false negative trigger is the words used is humanly impossible. So that can detect the automation. The other one is complete automation is you can say first, last, and glances this is automation. Okay. Uh, but again, it depends on what you use. The use purpose is to get the content. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. the automation because you're taking a script right. and converting into better language, mm -hmm. better outcome. But there are stats. Yes, yes. Proprietary stats. Yes, exactly. You don't want to copy those. Well, pieces. see, that's and that's why. I've spent, I spent about, I did about three revision, three editing rounds with the book, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, you can create a good and bad at the same time. Yeah. So <laughs> inside you are, it's very important. I got it. So it says, no, it just says, Amazon is collecting information about the use of artificial intelligence tools in creating content. And then, what is AI generated content? We define AI-generated content as text, images, or translations created by an artificial intelligence-based tool. You agree to adhere to our KDP content guidelines as part of the terms and conditions. Okay. We have to read those guidelines. Yeah, so, we're, so before we submit the manuscript, we're to make sure that it's, it's mm -hmm. it looks very human-written. Oh, and then there's another section. With I any book. Cycle. Oh, so yeah. oh, was that? I would break the cycle. Yeah. You can take the ideas from the AI and break it. So what we do is, if the paragraph is written by AI, you need to break that. So how would you break that? That's the that's your AI. skill set. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Break it. Break it up. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So so yeah. Break up the text. Okay. Yeah, you got to do it. I think you get the narration of because you are storytelling. Mm -hmm. If you know the storytelling. Yeah. You can say it in a different way. Yeah. It's the same story. The other thing too is, and this is, I recommend this to any author, even if they're uh, you know many times over New York Times best-selling author who've written you know ten books, etc., or you're a first-time author, is you have to get it a copy edited. So, with my first book that I wrote, I actually wrote everything by hand. That was back in 2017. I wrote everything by myself. I spent one hour every day for 45 days writing the book, and it was a you know, a nice little 26,000 word book, about 140 pages, but still, I sent it to a copy editor so that they can go and clean up the language, etc. So with any book that you write, even if it's something where you're using AI extensively to turn a transcript into a, into a book, you gotta get it, you know, copy edited. You know, proofread and copy edited is my recommendation, right? But I, I do encourage you all to go through this process, especially if you're creating a new technology and you want to write the book about it and you want to design a cat. Oh, the other thing too is, and I want to see if I can have an example here, is that it's also great at, dis at um, giving you the initial problems that your market might be experiencing. Now, obviously you've got to go out and verify that with qual qualitative interviews with your audience, but there was an example here that I used with ChatGPT where I used ChatGPT to come up with uh, problems for my target market, right? And this is for the book that I'm writing, startup book, which is what the, the topic of the book that I'm talking about right now. And what I, let me see, did, okay. Well, this is, no, this is not. Write down AI tech. <laughs> this is another. This is another session where I used an article about the the toilet paper shortage for the book. We only got a few minutes left, Fernando. Okay. Okay. We might have a few more questions, so you might want to wind down. I can't find it here, but I know what you can do, and it's really power. It's really actually scarily accurate. What I did was, 
um, is I asked chat, I said, look, my target market are founders and CEOs of custom software development companies from Mexico, Argentina, Colombia. What are their biggest concerns and uh, barriers for wanting to enter the US market? So chat gave me a, a list and it was like, I've been working with these guys for the last 10 years. And I looked at the list, I said, yep, yep. It was pretty accurate. And then I said, what are, what are some of the um, things that they're hoping to achieve by entering the US market? Why would a company in Mexico that does custom software development, just like a company from Russia or from India, why would they want to enter the US market? And ChatGPT said, well, they, you know, they can, they, they, they can make um, higher margins, they can uh, show their family that they're successful and their friends, et cetera. And it's funny because like I've had tequilas with some of these people and it's like, yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> it got up the emotional problems. And so you can actually use ChatGPT to help you in your initial efforts to sort of start looking at the problems in the marketplace so that you can start to design a category based on some of those non-obvious problems in the marketplace that we thought that we were all gonna have to live with, right? So that's, that's it for my presentation. There was a whole lot more um, that I could have covered from my book that I'm, that's coming out. But any other questions about the process? Is this your first book or did you? This is, this is my second book. Oh, second yeah, book. so my, my first book I wrote. Using AI. This is my first book. I, my book is, is, is my first book using AI. And I used AI for about 20% of my book. And then for my client's book, I'm using AI 100% for his book. That's 100% from his mouth, right? So that's, that's essentially what I'm doing now. I'm also... Um, your first book. Tell them about your first book. Yeah, my first book is called Nearshore Marketing. And that he wrote. Uh, yeah, so this. In 2017. Yeah, it's it's called nearshore marketing. It's all about you know how out you know outsourcers can enter the U.S. market through digital marketing strategies um, that can help them to be recognized as thought leaders, generate leads, you know, and generate sales in the U.S. market. But that's your experience. You put it in writing that book, right? Yes. That's your experience. What is the difference now that experience? How do you bring the real value you put into the book to the AI-generated content? Well, the, the, what I see is that even with a nonfiction book, which is supposed to be very, you know, about the facts and about how-tos, et cetera, you have to weave in a story, right? Yeah. So you, you almost have to use sort of like the, the, the hero's journey mm -hmm. that is used in most fantasy books or most science fiction books. You kind of almost have to bring that into uh, into a, a, a nonfiction book, and that's one of the things that, that you know you have to assist AI with, right? So, you know, we're we're opening up the introduction to the book with a story uh, of my client, you know, like a story of, with of him with GS1. GS1, they're the they're the ones who do all the barcodes, right? So it's like an industry association for the retail for retailers and food manufacturers, uh, not just food manufacturers. So we're gonna tell a story about him working with this company and it's gonna be sort of like one of these things that kind of draws you in and you wanna say, okay, what's next, what's next? So that's one of the things from my experience as a writer and also as a, you know, uh, 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 a book addict myself, you know, is you gotta weave in a story. Um, there's a book that I'm write, reading right now called Your First Thousand Copies. It's about selling your first thousand copies of your very first book. And um, the, the author opens up with um, a story about him on a train going to visit his client, Dan, Daniel Pink. His, his client was Daniel Pink and he was a web designer. And he says, I was you know, on the train, the train was moving and I was going over the presentation and I was nervous and I was trying to memorize what my proposal that I was gonna give to Daniel Pink for how I was gonna market his book. And the, the, the whole way he wrote it, you know, I was on the train, it sounded like one of those murder mystery model, you know, novels, you know, like Murder on the Orient Express or something. So that's one of the things that, you, you know, you got to do. You, you know, AI is not great at doing that. You have to kind of infuse your own stories with that. And you got to do that throughout the book, you know. I mean, Joe Polizzi is another great guy, a great author who writes 
He starts every chapter with a story. I think all the best nonfiction writers starts every chapter with a personal story about either themselves or somebody that, that they've read about or a client they've worked with. So are you self-publishing? Yeah, we're self book? we're self-publishing it. Yeah. I mean the people that are using, you know, getting people like Wiley or Penguin or Random House or people that have huge platforms, you know, like you know, tens of thousands of subscribers and, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of social media followers, you know, because the, the, the publishing companies want to see what your platform is. My client is starting from scratch, right? And, you know, I'm, you know, it's just, you know, so many people are self-publishing these days. I think Mark Schaefer did that with his first books and then he got a publisher, um, et cetera. How do you differentiate? I come from the publishing industry that's pretty much gone through what it's gone through the last 30 years. When you say you're publishing a book, how do you differentiate you producing a book compared to a digital, they could be a website or a blog or social media content, it's really just text, right? Yeah. Like, putting it on paper is, in most people's mind, a little antiquated, but you're finding success there. What? How do you differentiate, I mean, why would you go and publish a book and go through Random House or whatever compared to producing say, a portal that was subscription-based or I mean, I think small that, portion, you know, I, 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 I think that um, digital purchase. the book industry is, is, is alive and thriving. I mean, I think there are still people who are buying print books. I know my daughter. She's a millennial, 31 years old. She loves buying print books. The thing is, nowadays, I mean, I read all my books. I on my no, own. I still like print books. I never was into reading like I read all my books on the on the uh, Kindle app on my phone. I have a whole library there, and I think that there's like, if, if, did anybody go? Did anybody see the Alex Hormozzi book launch where he launched his new book, 100 Million Dollar Leads? Mm -hmm. Some parts of it. I did. Some parts. Okay, he he's published his book in three, and I would say four formats. It, you know, he has the print version, he has the digital version, and he has the audiobook version, which he actually has made available for free on Spotify. And then he has what I call uh, book as course. So he actually has a course that he has completely for free. You go, each, each chapter has a link to see if you want to expand on this, if you want me to expand on this, click here and you can go to my platform and see a video explanation of this concept, right? So I think a lot of people uh, are, are taking advantage of all these different multiple uh, form factors for books as a way of helping them to retain information. I mean, I think Amazon was really brilliant with their whole whisper thing, whisper sync uh, book narration where they actually fused Audible with Kindle. And now you can read a book and then when you can listen to the book and see how the cursor is automatically going through the words as you're listening to the book. Then you can listen to the book in the car, and then you pick it up on the, in your Kindle, and it's right exactly where you left it in the car, yeah. right? And it kind of enhances your your, your retention, right? Because we learn differently with reading or, or listening, and then you know touching and feeling a book, and you know leaving notes in a physical book, you know. And then you know for those who are like multimedia oriented, you know, of course. <laughs> Is audiobooks? Um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks while taking my journey walking for hours. Me too. Because sometimes, yeah, sometimes I feel like audiobooks, why the writer doesn't talk? Because... You mean um, like they're getting voice actors to do it? Yeah. Yeah, instead of, instead of voice actor, because sometimes I, I've listened to multiple times, Angela's Duck Woods and Kirk. A lot of times. Yeah, I know exactly. She's the one that talks about the the, some yeah. of the learning, right? Yeah. 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 So the, I always miss somebody's telling her story. Yeah. No. So I think so my go back and listen. Yeah. Why didn't she record audio? There's so much demand for the new generation because they rely on this so much social media. Yeah. I think the personal tone is missing. Yeah. A lot of storytelling in the books are real mm -hmm. and it's happened with experience. Why they don't say it? Well, you know, if you listen to, to the audiobooks by George, Joe Polinsky and Mark Schaefer, they, they do in their own books. What were you going to Oh, I, I, I have the answer. I, uh, I read a book. I, I listen a lot to a lot of Audible, too. 
and one of them was read by the author. It was not good. Yeah, they should I just need to write. Yeah. Yeah. They're not polished. Some of the guys, some of the guys, some of the guys, some of the guys. 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 Some of Million Dollar Book Challenge. It's Zachariah. His last. You can find him on LinkedIn. One book. One book millionaire. Yeah. One, book but millionaire. you can find him on LinkedIn. Zachariah Stratford. Yeah. And if you want to know more about him, just go to our meetup. He spoke. Um, Back in October. October. Yeah. It's on our meetup. You can click on it. Our meetup page. I'm sorry. I think I've gone way over. Yeah, we better go. Honey, we can start. Oh my goodness. What time is it? We're going to get a trail off. Oh my goodness. Thank you all so much for coming and for your patience with, you know. All right. Oh yeah, thank you for for uh, okay. for being a great audience. Yeah. So we're gonna stand right here, and we're gonna do a full length. Or, give, me, give me a sec. Oh yeah. Wait, she's gonna take her photo really fast. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to toss her. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you. It's very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. the category yeah. ideas. Yeah. And, uh, I know a lot of examples. Oh, yeah. And so oh, next one. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're old Yeah. Oh, you fantastic. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, she you wouldn't even know you. Yeah. So. Olga's our next speaker. So you're going to see her. Yeah. 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 And I want to take a picture. Two speakers together. So we kind of evaluate the plain thing. I wanted to ask about the category creation. Yes. Because uh, usually here is a balance between you can, for example, create a new category or you can just use some, something what already exists. But yes. yes. in this case, you have better maybe SEO. Yeah, yeah. What, what to choose? And, or maybe you need some balance. I, I mean, I think we're going to take a photo together. I want a full length because I want my boots. So do you want a picture of me because that was a selfie? Your boots, yeah, you've got cute boots. Yeah, I want a whole photo. We got, we got the whole range here. We got some <laughs> oh, you want the whole thing. Four hour. Okay. Video. Transcribe it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.